Okay, I think we're ready to start. Welcome everyone to our two-part webinar series on the events methodology organized by the Human Rights Information and Documentation Systems, also known as the Eurodox. The Eurodox is celebrating our 40th anniversary of developing methodologies and tools to help human rights defenders gather, organize, and use information to create positive change in the world. This webinar is supported by the permanent mission of Denmark to the, to the United Nations in Geneva and the Duster Shield Stilfung. I'm Bono Elgato, Eurodox's documentalist, and I am joining from California this morning at 6 a.m. as I moderate these roundtable discussions. This two-part series brings together experts in human rights documentation to reflect on the history, impact, and future directions of the events methodology. 30 years since its first publication, the event standard formats, directly and indirectly, has shaped human rights documentation initiatives across the globe, including the interrelated functions of documenting violations, creating archives, developing databases, and pursuing justice in its various forms. Since the publication's last revision in 2001, there have been considerable shifts in the human rights landscape brought about by the successes and failures of various transitional justice mechanisms, the politics between local and international actors and instruments, the emergence of new cases of violations, and the acknowledgement of various forms of justice, and of course, the development of new technologies applied to documentation. Through these roundtable discussions, we seek then to revisit the event's methodology and its iterations, particularly the standard formats and the microtesauri, to explore its potential future directions, and more broadly, ask what is the future of human rights documentation? For this first session, we reunite some of the key members of the Eurodox Task Force on Events and two of the co-authors of the event standard formats, first published in 1993 and revised in 2001. They will be talking about the history and development of the methodologies and the publications, how they have been utilized and adopted across contexts, and trace its impact and possible future directions. We are joined today by Judith Dweck, Bert Verstappen, and Aida Maria Noval. I will be briefly introducing them before their individual remarks and presentations, which will then be followed by a question and answer portion. I invite our participants to send in their questions throughout the webinar, and I'll go through them uh, during this Q&A. So let's start. Our first speaker, Judith Dweck, is an award-winning teacher, librarian, and writer. She was the first director of research, content, and scholarships for the Canadian Museum of Human Rights in Winnipeg. Judith served on the Eurodocs board from 1992 to 2009, being vice chair from 2002. She has shared the Eurodocs task forces. She has shared various Eurodocs task forces and co-wrote the event standards formats in Microtesauri. Two tools aim at standardizing the way in which human rights violations are documented and the language used to describe violations. Before retiring, she led seminars on documentation, human rights, and language, uh, and educational methodology. She sat on the International Lesbian and Gay Association Advisory Bo Board to develop, um, and jury the doc to develop and jury the Documentation and Advocacy Fund. Judith has written books and articles, include, including the award-winning book, Not in Our Schools, on the topic of censorship. She has written chapters in various books, including the lead chapter in Human Rights and Information Communication Technologies, Trends and Consequences of Use. Judith will be sharing a brief history of the development and revision of the event standard format and the micro I'll hand it over to you, Judith. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to see uh, all of you. I know some of you and many I'd like to get to know. Glad you're here. Let me take you back in time to the 1980s. That would be before some of today's human rights workers were born. Maybe some of you. Computers were not in common use. Internet was not even on the radar for most folks. Email and communication technologies were limited or even unheard of for many grassroots organizations. Many human rights organizations didn't even own a computer, 
and many were skeptical of technology. A different scenario from today. In the 1980s, I was living in the West Bank, working as the administrative director of Al Haq, the West Bank branch of the International Commission of Jurists. Our focus was on documenting human rights violations. It was clear we needed a systematic way to keep track of what was happening to victims and communities. We wanted to follow particular perpetrators, victims, witnesses, geographic areas. Like other on the ground human rights organizations, we had a huge number of paper files collected by our small staff, volunteers and field workers. We were a relatively small new organization working at developing systems to organize these paper documents. Our first computer was purchased in 1985 and our first email was sent to Amnesty International in the same year. We knew that when staff or volunteers left, their head knowledge went with them. This led to critical information loss, especially needed when human rights were most severely under attack. And then came the Rome Heterodox Conference in 1986. Previously, in 1985, Herodox did a survey of needs involving 40 human rights organizations. A key need was identified, systematize the documentation of human rights violations. Herodox had successfully developed the bibliographic formats based on library standards for small human rights organizations. Could those principles be applied to ongoing events? This was groundbreaking at the time. Herodox was a small office with an active board, one, maybe two employees, but it was linked to a large network. In Rome, the conversation around the need for a standardized systems deepened, but no one had envisioned a way forward on this. And here at the conference were the people, some of whom lived in dangerous situations, who felt passionately that such a system was needed. The conference was intense and fun, by the way, lots of fun. Tools were needed to get such information recorded in a systematic way, but what kind of tools? Somehow I was assigned to be a task force leader to develop, to develop such a system. However, there was no budget and the project remained in the conceptual stage. In 1987, I returned home to Canada. In 1988, I received a call from Hans Tollen, one of Herodoc's founders, inviting me to present my ideas and practical experience at the Society for International Development Conference in India. At the conference, there was, again, considerable enthusiasm around the idea of creating a standardized system for documenting human rights violations. It was almost a demand that tools be developed. A worldwide task force was established. Herodox managed to obtain funding to hold a series of meetings in various locations to consult a wide range of people, including Amnesty International, NGOs in Argentina, Chile, Zimbabwe, Costa Rica, Peru, and the Philippines, along with many others who had particular expertise and interest. It was a challenging opportunity and most of us were volunteers for this project. Our intention was to design a system that would cover most of what would be needed by a variety of human rights organizations, but flexible enough so that organizations with a particular focus could select specific relevant aspects for use. It should be usable for paper-based organizations, but we were already talking about computers and databases. At the start, decisions needed to be made by the leadership of various organizations. Initial contacts were made at that level, but these were not the people who could spend the time and energy to do the work. Human rights documentalists and librarians became involved because they had expertise, but we needed a much wider range of people. Technicians, IT folks, communications experts, academicians, and statisticians were all part of the project. Interns and volunteers with a variety of skill sets were an invaluable and critical part of the Herodox network, but Herodox still had very limited resources. 
we began to develop the standard formats, microthesauri, originally called supporting documents, and the matching computer programs, first EVSYS, then WinEVSYS, then OpenEVSYS, and other platforms. Some organizations used these books to develop their own programs. They were translated into a variety of languages and adapted for specific purposes. We had micro and macro challenges. On the macro level, the comprehensiveness of the tool seemed too complex or difficult for some people to understand. Too much training was needed. On the micro level, there were many debates about terminologies for describing details about people and events. In some cases, we could borrow already established terminologies from other organizations, but often we had to develop our own standardized coded vocabularies. This was really a long and sometimes difficult process, but for me, it was also an exciting experience to see how international collaboration can lead to re results with such long lasting impact. The project was constantly developing. Input from users and others encouraged change and development, not only to the terminology, but also to the structure. The first edition in computer program was a standard flat database published in 1993. It connected victims, sources, perpetrators, interventions to events. Almost immediately, a demand for revisions developed. The second edition, published in 2001, was based on a relational database concept. The relational aspect in the database was a very, very important change. A victim also often had several perpetrators and a perpetrator often had several different victims and operated in several different contexts. We realized we had to make allowances for those one to many and many to one and especially many to many relationships, which a flat database could not handle. Patrick Ball had significant input into the conceptual framework of a relational database. Nice to see you here, Patrick. <clears throat> and technology had come a long way since the 1980s. More was possible. This version also introduced concepts related, related to roles, acts within events and complex relationships. The 2001 edition also included some work on economic, cultural, and social rights, not complete, more is needed, but at least it was a start. A future project might begin to include more on environmental and indigenous rights based on the idea of indivisible rights. The microthesauri is a collection of 48 lists which can be used to populate the fields in the events formats. They include lists of countries, languages, ethnic groups, types of violations, religions, international instruments, and so on. There is also some information on how to develop the local thesauri. The word micro was used because they are all fairly small lists, some that rely on much bigger thesauri, such as the refugee thesaurus, the thesaurus of economic, cultural, and social rights, ILO classification of occupation, the World Directory of Minorities, etc. We were developing a system which could record history as it happened, use an indexing method to retrieve information years later, document the situation of a particular individual, whether perpetrator, victim, or witness, and track incidents in a particular refugee camp community or organization. As the project evolved, it became obvious that statistics and observable trends would be highly valuable, in fact, essential. And information formats for complaints and reports would also be useful. Could we have output formats? This led to a significant debate about the use of all this information and its security. Were we looking for a large database where everybody would send their information to a central collection point for everyone to use? Or were we aiming for databases that would allow organizations to do their own work, sharing it when appropriate? One of the major considerations was protecting the privacy and security of the individual. For example, if some kinds of information became available, it could result in dire consequences for some victims and witnesses, including death. This conversation went on for a couple of years. Ultimately, we encouraged organizations to create their own systems 
based on the event's methodology and share information as appropriate. There were other factors we needed to consider. The types of violations vary. Some organizations focus on specific groups of people, such as the rights of women or children. Some focus geographically. Some focus on institutions such as prisons or media. The type of information needed may be quite different when documenting torture, poverty, family reunification issues, or employment discrimination. The structure of the violation can vary. For example, a massacre with many victims and many perpetrators or the harassment of one victim by one perpetrator. Either can happen over time in several locations. What constitutes an event or an act? What are the definitions? Language varies. Direct translations are not always possible or may have subtle differences. Even in English, country to country terms vary. For example, in Canada, the word Aboriginal is used. In the US, American Indian is used. In Mexico, Indigenous is used. Different organizations have different mandates, sizes, resources, technology, staff, and skill levels. Some organizations require specific information before they act. What are the reporting requirements for different organizations? Confidentiality, reliable security concerns were important. The digital divide between those who have access to technology and those who don't remains a concern. How do we determine if the information is reliable? Could we just use free text instead of controlled vocabulary? For which fields? And I could go on. Herodox was ahead of its time and very innovative in finding ways of organizing information for human rights. For example, Martin Ennels, the founding Herodox president, a dedicated human rights activist and the first secretary general of Amnesty International was an exemplary visionary. When he would talk about organizing and standards way back then, and he would talk about information on human rights and effective exchange and advocacy, it sounded like he was talking about a computer, which wasn't there. Herodox was visionary, but it was also born out of practical needs at the grassroots level. And that makes Herodox quite exceptional. If I were to make one caution in revising or developing new tools, it would be this. Ensure that the people from rich countries are not dominating the process. Ensure that new or revised tools reflect the needs and wishes of those doing the documenting. Now in 2023, I am pleased that Herodox is again looking at the methodology for documenting human rights. The environment has changed over the years. Social media allows for immediate documentation of human rights horrors to the world. How should that information be held and accessed over time? Technology has developed and changed. New things are possible. How can we better use it? What role does AI play? And it does. Is standardization still needed? Has the development of human rights policies and laws helped protect human rights? And how does this play into how we collect information? How do we link the collection of information to advocacy making change in the world? Does racial and gender bias pervade technological algorithms? Technology offers powerful tools for society, but do developments in automation, robotics, and documentation raise concerns about the impact on human rights if these tools are used for ill instead of good. There are huge human rights challenges today. To name a few, human trafficking, refugees, gender equality, technology, privacy, security, and AI, media and misinformation, climate change and environment, racial justice and indigenous issues, poverty and inequality, and rights of non-citizens, and I could go on. Do we need to take such issues and others into account as we develop or reinvent documentation methods? There is still much to do. So congratulations to Herodox for taking another look at the events methodology, the Sasori, and human rights documentation in general. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, uh, for that 
a brief overview of the history and development of the events methodologies and the tools that surrounds it. Um, I'll hold off on my questions, but thank you so much for your provocations as well. Ooh. Our second speaker is, Ver is Bert Verstappen. Bert joined Eurodox in 1987 and for 32 years have served the organization in various capacities, eventually retiring as our senior documentalist in 2019. His shoes are the shoes, they're huge shoes that I attempt to fill. In addition to his work around the events methodology, uh, he also co-authored publications under the Human Rights Monitoring and Documentation series with Manuel Guzman. Through the years and across the globe, Bert has trained human rights defenders in documentation practices while also setting up information systems for various human rights organizations. Bert will be giving us an overview of the utility and adoption of the events method and the uh, event standard format uh, through the years. I'll hand it over to you, Bert. Thanks, Bodo. Yes, I'm very happy to, to be, be with you guys here today. It's nice to see Judith and Ida again after some time, and um, I'm glad to remain involved with, with her relax. Um, I would just like to make like a number of, of uh, comments and uh, reflections on, on basis of the very good uh, introduction, which was uh, just given by uh, uh, Judith. So um, first of all, yeah, yeah Harry Dogs indeed you know, developed the event standard form, which and it was then uh, presented to human rights organizations as a useful resource for documenting uh, human rights violations. Uh, the formats are, are quite broad and try to take into account um, the, uh, you know, the, the large variety uh, of, of, of human rights organizations that, that are out there. And then, as you know, um, the number of human rights groups just continue to grow. They're also facing uh, more and more repression in, in, in more and more countries. At the same time, there is still this large variety with regard to their aims, uh, the rights and the violations that they seek to document, uh, the, the staff which they have and, and, and the other resources plus the context um, of, of, uh, of, of the work. So basically, we, we tried to focus on the adaptation according to local needs. Um, while working with most groups, we started by indeed looking into their needs and, and the local uh, situation. And, and But there were also very specific adaptations, uh, just to mention two rather early one. Uh, one was uh, for a project uh, to document violations after the 1994 genocide in uh, uh, Rwanda. We worked together with International Alert and local human rights groups, and, and, and we developed an adaptation uh, called Genesis. Another uh, example is um, work done on documentation of violations against women. We worked together with the Coalition Against Trafficking in Women, Asia Pacific. And, 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 and these uh, and this adaptation was then indeed used for, for training at, at, at the local level in the Philippines and also within the region. Um, also, uh, the, um, I, I, I think what is important is that we realized uh, that uh, and human rights organizations doing documentation work realized while working with, with our Redux that there is no quick and dirty solutions with regards to the ways in which they do the documentation work. And some organizations indeed felt overwhelmed by the large number of options provided by the formats. And basically we pointed out that they should start with looking at their own situation and, and their own needs and, and then build up the system on basis of that. I've always seen like defense standard formats and micro sorry, as, as a kind of menu where you basically select what is most appropriate, and but this project of and this process of selection was not always that uh, that easy. Uh, groups tended to say, "Hey, we're going to need this and this and this," but then afterwards realizing that you know there's also quite some uh, time and other resources required to gather and and, and record all that information. So uh, and it took groups to need some some time to realize that that often small is beautiful. Um, I consider the, the Hurricks work in standardization useful already because it allows human rights groups to learn from experiences made by like-minded groups so that they do not need to start from scratch and, and, and reinvent uh, the wheel. And then I, I think also we've, I'm talking a bit about training as well, we've seen also um, a kind of 
uh, change in, in the approach uh, which we had, which we had uh, with regard to spreading the word and, and making organizations familiar with our tools for documenting uh, violations. Initially, we focused on providing training to a larger number of organizations. And uh, we, uh, we also did training of trainers. Uh, we set up regional uh, networks. And this has always led to an interesting exchange of information. And, and it, it also really enhanced the capacities of documentation uh, workers and information workers. But it did not necessarily have a longer term impact on how an organization as a whole manages its documentation and information. And th therefore, after a couple of years, we moved to a different approach, which we call the cap capacity building approach, where we sought to wor work more in depth with individual organizations, also engaging your leadership to look at the substantial issues, as well as the resources required for documentation. And these partnerships often have lasted uh, several years and, and that's to publications and then also an issue to maybe internal databases and over, over the, the last years in particular to, to public uh, databases where organizations share information which, which they're willing to share taking into account of course uh, security issues and, and the need to protect uh, fitness, uh, uh, victims and witnesses. Uh, with regard to the macro, to, sorry, uh, uh, Judy already mentioned that we de developed a lot of terminology uh, list in, in, in the first edition, 1993, we had 13, uh, but then we really uh, made quite some efforts to, to deepen out the whole question of terminologies and actually the second edition of 2001 at 48 macro, sorry. And there again, organizations had to choose which uh, lists were most relevant from them and also adapt them to, to the local needs. Um, we also, uh, the, in, in developing those lists, uh, we recognized um, high quality re existing resources uh, coming from the United Nations and other bodies and basically we adopted and uh, simplified them. At the same time, uh, those uh, terminology lists in, in general and, and, and some particular macro we were later on also used by other organizations involved in documenting violations of human rights, but also for other purposes. And there are some examples in the field of um, groups and networks working on torture, on war trauma, on, on public health, etc. And then uh, my final command is indeed, as um, Judith mentioned, there's like three softwares which we developed throughout the years. The first one was called FSIS. Uh, based on DBase compiled in Clipper and uh, around 2000, that was re replaced by WinFSYS, uh, uh, developed in Microsoft Access, which was a very uh, commonly used uh, software at the time. And then, of, of course, we moved to open source uh, tools around 2010 and uh, produced OpenFSYS. So basically, these three softwares all mirrored the contents of the events uh, standard formats and the terminologies. Um, this uh, changed actually over the last couple of years when uh, we uh, heard or developed um, the WASI as software. WASI was initially uh, developed for managing various types of collections of, of, of documents, uh, which could be case law, which could be reports, et cetera. And only after a couple of years, uh, Heredox started to work on, the, on uh, adapt, making adaptations for documenting human rights uh, violations. And you can also say that that WASI makes less use of, of, of standards than uh, the, the previous softwares. I think this is something which, which requires further discussion, what indeed is still the need for, for standardization. I think there's still some need uh, for basically using standard approaches. I think it does also help organizations on the way, avoids duplication of, of, of effort, but maybe we should not go too much in detail anymore, taking also into account the fact that documentation is um, taking quite some time and, and, and resources to, to be done. So I think we have to have like a sound but realistic approach for, for the human rights documentation, documentation of violations. Thank you. Thank you. 
so much, Bert. Uh, we'll definitely circle back to that during our Q&A, during our roundtable in terms of uh, standardization. And uh, just to prep uh, Judith, Perth, and Ida, I would be interested in hear more about this, the, need, the articulated need and demand for standardization during the 80s and the 90s, um, and how perhaps we could revisit it today in terms of what just Bert mentioned, um, in terms of the, the usefulness or the utility or the limits of standardization. But before we go to that, uh, our th I would like to welcome our third speaker, Aida Maria Naval. Aida has worked in human rights information and documentation handling for over 35 years, both in Mexico and in several other countries. Her activities have mainly involved designing, setting up, managing, evaluating, um, and developing tools and trainings on documentation centers um, and in documenting human rights violations. Aida has worked mainly with NGOs, um, relatives and collectives of victims of the disappeared. Uh, she has been associated with Eurodocs for many years, in particular in tool development and training. She is proudly a librarian in training. Um, Aida, I'll hand it over to you. Hi, thank you, Bono. Can you hear me? Hello? You well, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to hear it also for the invitation and the opportunity to share experiences with all of you, and in particular with my two dear colleagues from the Herodox All Guard, and to be working with the new Herodox Vanguard. That's very nice. I'm very sorry to, but I will have to look at my notes. And I apologize because my English is a little bit rusty, but I'll do my best to keep in time. Right. Um, I was asked basically to share uh, my experiences as a user and as a trainer of the methodology, the tools and the applications. Um, I just would like to recap in the most basic of terms, um, the methodology can be summarized in the classic Patrick Bowles, who did what and how, to whom, where and when. That's that's the, 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 the core of the methodology. And through recording, analyzing information and following, following this methodology, it is possible to arrive at the why, why things happen, why the event happened to that particular person, and therefore get closer to establishing responsibility. This allows us to, or at least takes us closer to achieve our overall goals of determining the truth of what happened, establish accountability, achieve justice, reparations, and ensure non-repetition. That is the framework in which we all work. The events methodology draws from many, many, many sources the terribly vast experience in documenting human rights violations in a variety of contexts and countries. That's a primary source, but also various fields of a specific and specialized knowledge, human rights normativity, theory, research, legal systems and mechanism, heavy part, criminal and forensic investigation, statistics, information sciences, social sciences, psychosocial approach, because we always deal with victims and their needs. So there are many others and they all go into the methodology. We all draw from one or another at different times. And the methodology is human rights based, but enhanced by knowledge and experience from many other sources. The core of the events methodology, I would say, is solid, but methodology on the whole is very alive and in continuous development. We develop it every day by incorporating uh, new terms, new information, new knowledge. The context changes and the methodology evolves. 
and is capable of um, absorbing the changing scenarios, which is not always the case for the formats and the applications. But the methodology it can, can absorb the changes in the world. There are the necessary add-ons uh, to sustain a case of human rights beyond the who did what, how, to whom, where, and when. And they are not easy to deal with. Sources, sources have become so complicated. I'm a librarian by training. And the days when the difficulty was to record um, systematically testimonies and maybe audios, but now all the way to social media, it's complicated. And uh, the requirements for proof in court are increasingly difficult. Another field that uh, has increased is the what is done in response to the event. I work in particular in disappearances and the case of the disappeared person is usually very, very, very short. The bulk of the documentation goes in uh, the interventions done by the relatives and it's not easy and it changes country to country. Um, there are many other add-ons depending on the purpose of um, documentation. The structure of the events, it's a, it's a necessary development and that's where the formats come in. But they imply, as Judith clearly said, um, a certain rigid and fixed order hierarchy, definition and the limitation of identities and their attributes, rules and guidelines to record information, although also to help users make decisions on how to use the tool. Standards, and we'll go back to standards as I understood from Bono. And the organization of the information for retrieval, and this is very important, retrieval, preparing um, how to record information for retrieval, in particular for statistics or crisscrossing information. It's very important and that's allowed by the format. But as has been said before, both by Judith and Bert, um, no one structure fits the exact needs of any documentation work. There is no way around this. The structure always needs to be adapted. The, we will never be able to produce anything that fits anyone. It has to be adapted. Uh, in training, uh, a time has to be devoted to discuss the characteristics, features, applicability, and limitations of the structure in relation to the needs of the participants who are the eventual users of the format or the application, or at least go back to the words embedded with the ideas of the methodology so that they can improve their work. But if we hope uh, that they adapt uh, or adopt the formats, a lot of time has to be invested in discussing the, the features. The applications, well, they go all the way from the paper forms, notebooks to databases or cell applications, spreadsheets, they are all still around. The most sophisticated and the least sophisticated. And we have to cater for them in whatever method we produce. Um, I have seen many applications, very few of them terribly, terribly bad. But most of them are well-developed, relational, user-friendly, and the easiest part uh, to train on. People get on very quickly in using a particular application, particularly if it's a technological application. 
um, is not so is not so easy to deal with the form, the structure. And the emphasis has to be on the methodology. It, and this has to be intensely supported by case analysis, analysis of real cases that participants work on. In my experience, this usually takes the bulk of the training time, but it's worth it because if the methodology is appropriated by the, the trainee, everything else will be um, much easier. Obviously the best training as Beth said, takes on site. And that also allows the trainer to understand the real working environment, which is very different to a, an isolated training where people are only devoted to, to the training. Well, human rights violations are a universe of variables which combine in a unique way in any one case. It is not the same to document the rights of one group or the other, women, indigenous peoples, journalists, you name it. Nor is it the same to document uh, different types of violations, torture, disappearance, discrimination, environmental rights. Each case of human rights violations is absolutely unique, unrepeatable and different from any other. And we really have to understand this when we're talking about developing methodologies. Determining patterns and recurrences highlights the similarities that a group of cases share but do not make them the same. The events methodology for BMFN, as you can see, is as certain and universal as the sun raising and setting every day. The methodology is, is a, a paradigm, um, even an ideology if you want. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of analyzing information through case analysis to document human rights events increasingly better, more thoroughly, and with elements to achieve our goals, even litigation eh, with acceptable proof, which is difficult. The methodology holds true for all human rights events. That is its strength and beauty. The same cannot be said about the structured, standardized formats by their own nature. I mean, um, they can be, and they should aspire at being wonderful references uh, to pick and choose, to add, to modify, to adapt, to provide further sources or resources where we can expand and, and adapt to our needs. Applications are likewise more suitable if they are based on an ad hoc adaptation. Having said all this, it is very, very important to make explicit um, the advantages, advantages of standardization and the need for the end user to make certain concessions in order to benefit from the standardization. I think I will leave it here. Sorry if I went over the time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ida. Uh, there's some beautiful quotes there uh, in terms of how you frame methodology. Um, and so thank you so much. We'll officially open the Q&A between uh, Bert, Judith, uh, Ida, and I. I would invite our attendees to send in their questions via Q&A, via the Q&A function of Zoom. While we're waiting for um, the questions to come in from the attendees, I do have a uh, couple of questions for the three of you. Um, and we'll start off with regards to standardization, uh, a common theme across your three presentations. And so, Judith, during your uh, um, during your remarks, you were talking about how the standard format really grew out of this uh, um, need 
if not demand, actually, even you use the word demand um, from various human rights groups across the globe. Can you speak of the rationale or what what drove this demand for standardization? Um, and then after that, I'll fo a follow up question with Berth and uh, uh, Ida. Uh, what do you th you both speak of the the strengths and the limits of standardization? Um, do you think that this demand for standardization uh, still exists today? Um, Judith. Okay, so <clears throat> the demand actually was, I think, in in my opinion, and that's going back many years. Uh, was people didn't know how to access the information after the fact. After a year or two years or five years, um, the people who had gathered the information on paper formats, um, nobody knew how to access it anymore. And the people had left who did it. So there was no uh, institutional memory of what had happened. So I'm talking back in the day of paper formats. They didn't know how to organize them and they didn't have computers, but they did have training in terms of being librarians uh, or being documentalists. So they had the concepts, but they needed a way to get at the information. And that's where the demand started, uh, in my opinion. And it carried on and carried on. And then when computers became available, well, some were at Hal Hawk, for example, we were keeping track of things on spreadsheets then. Um, at that point, we weren't using databases, but we did use spreadsheets and you could search spreadsheets. But you still needed a form of standardized vocabulary, not for everything, and maybe the current formats have too much standardization, but you still needed, st uh, for example, um, a standard way of recording names. Now that sounds really simple, John Smith. What's, what's, what's unusual about that? Except that in Arabic, for example, the name might be kind of translated or it might be spelled differently in one context or another might be um, it might have changed completely because if you have a boy child you're and you're a man you're then called abu whatever the boy's name is and that's how you're commonly referred to so that's like a completely different name from earlier before you had that child so you have to find a way of standardizing the name or otherwise you can't search for the same person. Um, and of course, library science has that all down pretty pat and you can draw from that, which the original supporting documents give uh, considerable um, time to. That's not in the new microthesauri, but it does outline it there. Uh, dates, another example of where you would need to have it in a standard way because, well, if you're searching on a date and you're using month first and then the date, or you're using the date first and then the month, that you've got a problem. So those are simple standardizations. But the demand also came for, okay, we want to search by area. All right, again, if you're not using a standard way of doing it, you've got a problem. Um, and then some of our... Um, some of our, our network people, uh, especially the networks, they had centers in different geographic areas. And so you wanna record things as precisely as you can. So you'd like standardization in the, in the places. The most complicated is probably when you get to subjects. And what are the terminologies you use there if you want to search on a certain kind of torture or you want to search on torture as a general term? Um, so the, the need for standardization was expressed at that time um, because people wanted to be able to search to find things, even when they still had paper documents, which is why they used the spreadsheet initially. Um, in those days also, the free text search mechanisms were not developed. That came with time, 
So, I mean, there's lots of possibilities with free text where you wouldn't necessarily need a full on standardized approach. And that's developed much more now even, but there still are things where you want common understandings. Um, I don't know, Bona, do you want me to carry on or is that is that enough to no, start? I think, with? I think it's pretty clear. I, um, okay. If I get what you're uh, saying is that this demand was access driven. It was search driven. Um, yeah. It was probably analytically driven, right? Um, and so there were clear, because of this, there were clear end users um, that were creating these demand or was articulating this demand. Um, so Britt and, and Ida, um, speak, you also both spoke of standardization. Um, Britt, you were talking about the systems that was developed by Eurodocs based on the event standard. Um, what exactly was the relationship of the event standard and these tools? Um, yes, well, the event standards basically was like the paper forms and actually uh, I browsed earlier today to the first edition of the uh, event standard forms from 1993 and, and, and we almost uh, apologize for actually also having something uh, based upon the database because we realized at the time that for many organizations uh, a, a database was something far away and, and, and it sounded like something from the future and was mainly accessible for organizations uh, based upon uh, based in the north but 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 not really for local human rights groups in the south and of course that, that that's something which has uh, changed um, I, I was just thinking if we actually would we set up the task force on events uh, documentation would become our up for the similar project uh, and, and outcome. Um, probably in, in, in some regards, yes. Yeah. So Aida has talked a lot about methodology. I think she's very uh, right in, in, in pointing out also that I think the who did what, the whom, where, and when, and why, that are still the basic questions which have to be answered. At the same time, there have been so many uh, in interesting developments which make uh, the picture different uh, these days and which one also would have to take into account. And as, as Judith mentions, free text search or full text search, it is now and you can just search through complete uh, large collections of documents with, with one single uh, search bar. That, that, that was obviously something which was not available at the time. And, and, and another aspect which we have not really mentioned a lot yet, but which is probably even too obvious, is, is, is the large variety of, of types of sources which we can use uh, now. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, using social media as a source, where Bellingcat and many other groups are doing very interesting work. I'm thinking about uh, aerial uh, photography, um, which, which are both methods which are probably mainly still used by larger international uh, uh, NGOs, etc. I don't know how well spread they are within the global south, but but certainly the use of a video has become very very common, and that that's a, a tool for documentation, which is very widely accessible now. Also, thanks to the training of witness and with regard to how to document human rights uh, images and, and, and making films on, on, on cases of violations. That, I think that, that's very important. I still see some, some further work to be done uh, be, between organizations such as uh, Witness and, and, and Haridox to look into all that uh, aspect. So yes, there's still needs for, for standardization there, uh, in, in terms of the, the, the general matter, uh, maybe less for, you know the, the 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 more elaborate kind of of, of formats as 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 we developed them uh, thirty five thirty years ago. Yeah, I can think of um, a standardization which goes hand in hand with categorization, which is the foundation of any machine learning or natural language processing or AI applications. And so, I I can see we can all see like the connection between. Uh, these standards, uh, the event standard, and any mechanism um, that uh, utilizes these set of technologies. But I wonder, Ada, Ida, Ada, uh, please correct me of what your preference is in terms of uh, calling your name. Ida. Um, <laughs> Ida. Okay, so Ida, uh, you mentioned this in, in passing, but can you speak more of the, the tension then between standards and contexts? Uh, you speak quite eloquently. Standards and? Contexts. Um, 
and how when we when mm. when we develop trainings or when we when we apply these methodologies, like we need to be context specific, context cent uh, context centric um, on 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 the ground. But I was wondering if you can speak more of, of, of these tensions and based on your experience of developing tools and training programs, how do you then develop, you know, adaptation or adoption of, of, of standards and methodologies to specific contexts? Okay, first, I would like to finish on the standards, if, if I can. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, because it bears on it, it bears on your, on your question. I think the, the standardization it was a need, now it's compulsory. Standardization is absolutely needed for retrieval, communication, quality um, in certain areas. And that's, that's the key point where we're going to develop or not. Uh, everything to do with international and technological needs to be standardized. Um, the elements of proof of all these um, social media uh, sources, metadata, no metadata, it's not acceptable. And you wouldn't believe it, but even people who have never used a database or anything, they become extremely good at ensuring that the source is properly tagged. So standardization in that sense, international use and communication, geolocations, everything. It's a kind of compulsory now. There is also, I think what Judith was referring to, it can be placed at the local level of standardization. They may not like what it comes in the formats, uh, the explanations, the definitions, the restrictions of certain standardization, be it for names or whatever, but they can develop their own. If they take the methodology and they can do their own standardization for as long as it's standardized within the organization, that's a wonderful thing. That's a big step. And that takes me to, to your question. Everything has to be adapted. Um, to the context in general and specific terms. Um, the general is where, where you work, which country, which environment, which security, what type of uh, violation. And the, the small one is inside the, the organization, if it is an organization or the collective. Um, what are the conditions? And so adaptation and development of things, um, tools in general, need to be context, contextualized. I don't know how you say it in English. Um, developed within the context, developed with the users, uh, because otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, very good ideas and people get carried away because they like, I remember the phrase of the Heredox glow after the trainings and the events and the conferences, um, Coffee Comado pointed. And obviously it's a, it's a, it was a Heredox glow because the, what we say in the, in the formats and the tools, it's wonderful. It makes sense. It's what we all aspire to do. The problem is, can we do it? So I don't know if I answered your question. I hope so. Yeah, you did. Now I'm I'm trying to. Uh, <laughs> in my recent uh, experiences with Eurodox, if I've ever come face to face with uh, the Eurodox glow with some of our partners <laughs> in the work that we did. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> Um, uh, I was wondering then, uh, throughout your, you all were talking uh, as well about the intersection between methodology and standards and tools. Um, Bert and Judith, how was the development of methodologies and standard coincide with our tools 
during that time, during the first two decades of Eurodox, two, three decades of Eurodox, were they, uh, was the development of the standards, methodologies, and the tools, as in the, our databases, our uh, um, IT solutions, um, was there communication between uh, those two directives, and how did that go? Uh, well, um, let me see if, yeah, I'm not muted, right? You can hear me? Um, <clears throat> well, Bert probably has more to say about this, so I'll keep this really quite brief. But no, they developed together. But of course, the, the, da the database and the computer programs were always a little bit behind, but sometimes pushing the process as well. So the first, uh, the yellow book, the big yellow book, if none of you have if you've never seen it before, this is the big yellow book. There's two of them, this one and the supporting documents. They came out. And of course, we were immediately working on, on the computer programs at the same time. But that was already pushing the need for change. And so then it moved more closely to the relational database quite quickly, actually, especially with the push of Patrick Ball. And thank you, Patrick, for that. And then it began to both the computer program and the written formats developed together. But was then it was more a push from the computer programs, but always a push from the grassroots and what they needed. Um, so I'll stop it there. And I think Bert probably has more yeah. to say. Yeah, I, I, I think that, you know, I recall we had you know, this, this task force, which, which Judith was leading, which consisted of uh, uh, human rights workers, which had been doing uh, documentation of human rights violations in their own countries, in, in dictatorships, uh, such as Chile, um, Peru, uh, Zimbabwe, Philippines, plus organizations which received a lot of information on violations, Amnesty International, as well as torture, the, the, the International Conference of Free Trade Unions. And, um, so basically, we, we, we took into account their, their needs and, and, and their experiences. Um, and then, you know, after the first uh, edition, which you just showed, the, the yellow books, um, we received the course, organization started using uh, the, 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 the tools, both the database, which was developed according to the, the formats. And also we ourselves um, got further in terms of thinking of what is human rights uh, violation, as you just mentioned. I think that if you look at the differences between the first and the second edition, main points is that um, we started to make a distinction between uh, events and acts, uh, where e e e event is like the larger uh, unit with the general location and time, but within um, each event there can be one or, or several acts which are then individual cases of, of violations. Uh, we also uh, started uh, in, in including the, the concept of roles, where basically um, a, a person within an act has has a role which can be victim, uh, perp uh, perpetrator, source, or intervening party. But it can be different from one event uh, to to the other. A person can first be a victim and then later on become a, a witness or even a perpetrator. So we took that that dynamics into account as well, um, um, and and then also as, as as mentioned before, we we did a lot of work on terminologies. The the first edition had thirteen list of um, uh, vocabularies, and, and and the second edition had the forty eight micro -tosaurus. It was also expanded uh, quite a lot. Um, another thing which actually I, I would like to uh, mention. Is that you know we talk about about methodology that sounds a little bit research that sounds a little bit tiring etc and, and and abstract at the same time uh, looking at the experiences which we had with training I, I think what organizations really experienced and, and appreciated in working with Heridox was that it was very uh, pragmatic and it had to do with their daily work and and, and the way they organize their information we worked with the documentalists and information workers for which uh, what we did was really an eye opener and it learned uh, uh, them to, to basically see their own work with, 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 with different eyes also to to feel proud about what, what they were doing and, and and to get like a better understanding on how they could do things in in, in a different way i think that's important as well
I think that's the strength of having um, documentalists, uh, librarians, and archivists that are able to bridge the conceptual and the practical in their day-to-day -day work. So I just shout out to the four of us who are all <laughs> librarians, archivists, and documentalists in their own right. Um, but that speaks to the, the other point that you mentioned, Judith, that really uh, this demand that came from the, from, from the ground in terms of uh, what the human rights space needed necessitated an interdisciplinary transnational global response. And so nuts and bolts wise, how did you all put all of these folks from different disciplines and uh, different contexts across uh, different regimes to come together and agree <laughs> to a certain extent? Because <laughs> I feel like that's another. <laughs> no, you're all laughing because we're we're gonna be if we're gonna embark on this new project. I think we're, and the current political climate is, I would assume, is not as conducive as it was probably before. But yeah, what can what advice from your experience of of um, putting this uh, team task force together can you give us? Well, the the task force was largely put together. Um, by the, the founders who were very active board members. And they knew, I mean, I knew Al Haq because I had worked there, but I wasn't, and I met people at that Herodox conference, which was a focus on documentation. And so the, the first place to stop, to get, were the organizations who were already working on it. And those were pulled together. And yes, at the beginning, it was a bit of a mess. Everybody had different ideas. Everybody was going somewhere else and doing so. I mean, they all had objectives. And basically, I think what we did was just listen. We listened. We collected. We collected lists, like librarians do. Uh, and we just collected and collected and collected and then began to put the things together. Um, and those who could contribute did, and those who were too busy, I mean, it was nobody was paid. Uh, so it was just a matter of the people feeling passionately that this was a need. And if you feel passionately about something, you also have strong opinions about how it should be done. So yes, there were very strong differences of, the, of opinions. Uh, but, but with each meeting, and I've forgotten how many we had, Bert, maybe it was four? Three. 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 Okay, we had three before we came out with the first one. Uh, but the, at that point, then there was, you know, there was a lot of writing that went on. And I mean, the, the, the yellow books are fat. I don't know if you can see that. They're fat. And they were referred to as the fat yellow books afterwards. Um, and so we just started out based on what we had heard and what what organizations would send us we asked them to send us the forms they used so we gathered as many forms as we could and then we looked for commonalities and these were from all over the world and then we put them together now we didn't have we didn't have the risk challenges that you have with some of the technologies today. We did have risk challenges and that came into the that came into the exchange of information. How freely will you give up your information? Today, once you start with technology and if that information is available everywhere or becomes available, there's a danger. And one has to keep that in, in mind. In any case, we gathered these forms together and that's how we came up with the first set of forms what did what were people gathering what did they need so before bono you said it was really driven by um what was what what the demand was from outside it, it was not necessarily outside the organization but within the organization what information did they need to pull out to make their interventions or right. their requests to amnesty or sos torture or somebody else um so maybe I've talked too much there. Some of the others may want to say something. You know, be, before I hand it over to Bert, because he has his hand up, uh, that I now have a new uh, uh, <laughs> a phrase that will guide my work, which is to listen and to make lists. 
There's a alliteration <laughs> there somewhere that is really nice. Yeah. Uh, Bert. Yeah, yeah. Actually, another strategy which, which we uh, used and which was quite successful is actually that um, we had uh, in the task force all the participants writing papers about the topic which was uh, dear to them. So one member wrote about the advantages of standardization, somebody else wrote about the challenges of standardization, a third person wrote about security, et cetera. So, so that also then you know, provided more substance to, to the debate. That was, in addition, that was in addition to the three yeah. meetings yeah. of the task force. It was a little um, seminar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. In Utrecht, we had indeed uh, a seminar. And actually, indeed, as Judith said, you know, we collected a lot of uh, sources, uh, standards used by other organizations, but we also talked with a lot of people, including uh, persons working in the United Nations and in, in, in the human rights field, uh, regional organizations, recipients of uh, information about violations, trying to find out what is most suitable for them to be able to, to respond. And then, of course, questions also came up as, as, as the burden of proof, uh, uh, how deep should the human rights NGO uh, go to be able to actually prove that this was a violation. And that, that's also something which is, you know, coming back uh, again now when we talk about providing evidence to international criminal courts, for example, uh, but, but the, the standard is, 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 uh, of, of proof is, is higher than, than when an NGO just uses information for its own uh, reporting purposes, for example. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ida, uh, sure, I think she has a response for this one. I'm inviting also all of the attendees to uh, drop in your questions. Otherwise, I'll throw in my questions. Ida. Uh, this, uh, I, I think, highlights the overall question of tool development and that Herodox should really think about it. It hadn't clicked that the change, I mean, I had forgotten that the change between the first and the second edition uh, was a separation of event into events and acts. Less than two years ago, I did a piece of work for a very good, highly specialized organization. And there was no way in this world I could get into their thinking, the idea of the event, the concept of the event as separated from the act. I had to develop only one and I did and it worked, but it worked because the methodology was there and it's so solid that I could actually adapt. But it just clicked that so many years ago, some people are going back to what we produced in what, 93. So that's one thing. And the other one is, Bert mentioned it, but it's very important. Small and simple, simple in the sense of not unnecessarily complex. It's beautiful and it's the best. And this application, this uh, design I did a couple of years ago, it, it, it was that, it had to be simple. It, they didn't want the complexity. They couldn't cope with the complexity. So small and simple is the most effective in my experience. That was out of the blue. Yeah, I have a follow-up question on that, but Judith has a point, Judith. I I just wanted to emphasize what you said there, Ida. In both of the uh, editions, there is something called a short format. And that was an example of a format that was not uh, as complex as everything else. It was drawn like a subset of the various fields. And we recognized that need for simple right from the start. And that's why we included a short format as an example of you can pick and choose. Um, so thank you, Ida and Bert. Mm -hmm. We're jogging each other's memories of all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ida, going back to the, the, the methodology, the events methodology. So I, I, I teach this in classrooms as well. Um, and often 
Um, one of the key questions that is always brought up by uh, emerging or newer human rights defenders is the question of how do we apply or how do we adopt the events methodology to environmental justice, um, specifically when, for example, the notions of who is not clear, or at least the framing seems to be a bit broad. Like, for example, an environmental justice organization who is trying to account for the violence and the impact of uh, global warming or air pollution in a particular community. Um, how did we, how how does the methodology, because I agree with you, I think it's rich and I still go back to it and it's still adoptable, but that is like the one question I'm slightly stuck yeah. with. <laughs> and I just throw the question back at the students. Yeah. <laughs> but I was wondering, Ida, if you um, have any uh, idea uh, in terms of, yes, how the events methodology can be utilized mm -hmm. uh, in terms of environmental justice. Sorry. Um, it goes back to the same basic principle. Conceptualize the event, one event. The overall goal um, is to combat climate warming, which is global, global, global. Okay. But what's the event that we want to document. We're talking about documenting and building up towards a full case of or against uh, climate uh, warming. It implies going from specific cases, events. I use the word cases because that's what we use in Spanish, but events. So the methodology helps identify Clarify, what's the event? What mm. are the different events that we're going to, to document and building from there? I think that's the simplest mm. uh, comment I can make. And it, it applies to anything. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, yes, Bert, I think Bert has a point. Yeah, I think it's also you know, looking at the experiences we indeed had with, with our events, seven formats. Um, they were basically worked best in, in, in the context of trying to document uh, civil and political uh, rights, including torture, uh, deaths, extrajudicial uh, killings, disappearances, etc. Uh, also freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, expression uh, cases. Um, it became already more uh, sophisticated to actually try to document violations of economic, social, and cultural rights using the event methods. Though it, it is possible, but uh, it, it requires some, some, some more thinking through and it, it does take a little bit more time. And the same also with environmental uh, justice. I think the method would indeed best work with cases where there is like a more or less known uh, perpetrator who basically the company that dumps uh, rubbish in, 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 in the river, that one would be able to document. But indeed, global warning uh, as a phenomenon, you would need other, other indicators. You would need to do uh, surveys, setting up indicators and benchmarks, the, the way mo most commonly actually work with economic, social, and cultural rights. Probably some of those principles will have to be combined with the events method actually work on uh, environmental uh, justice. It's, um, and, and then you have to see what, what, what is the focus of a particular uh, project. Yeah, that makes sense. And to piggyback on Ida's point in terms of uh, using the events methodology, one use of the events methodology is through case building. So understanding the context and also the case that is being developed that perhaps the events methodology can be drawn and be adopted accordingly. Um, we're running out of time and I feel like we could go on and on and on and on. Um, I'm really honored to be in this space with the three of you. I stand in your amazing broad big shoulders as uh, I think Ida puts it uh, quite uh, eloquently that we are uh, vanguard standing on and continuing the work of the old guard so to speak. But uh, we hope that as we continue really this project, uh, as we launch this multi-year initiative of revisiting the events methodology and its iterations, um, that we can continue having these conversations and exchanges with you. Um, as 
a final remark then, given this project and initiative of revisiting the event standard, uh, can you give us just a short uh, final remark in terms of what you think we should consider um, in uh, moving forward, uh, given this project at hand? Uh, and I'll start with, uh, let's go the other direction. Let's start with Ida and then Bert and then Judith. Okay, well, yeah, very difficult question. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in your shoes, Bono. <laughs> um, what I have ended up doing through the years and consolidated in, in recent years is I don't do formats. I do kind of huge spreadsheets with the specifications. And from there, we pick and choose. I mean, organized by entities, but for example, um, only person and how it is applied to the different roles and the specifications of uh, particular uh, things that need to be documented for the perpetrator. Does I end up with kind of um, the perpetrator has four or five fields, no more. And the victim is the one that has particularly the victim um, of uh, disappearance has many more fields. But my, my representation of the methodology and the necessary structure, because it's absolutely necessary to have a structure. It's kind of a huge pot where I can pick and choose. And people pick and choose, I mean, end users pick and choose from what for me are different entities and they shouldn't be mixed, but they can be mixed. So it's kind of, that's why I ended up doing through the years. Um, I'm not sure that something as structured in entities as was done in 2001 would be worth the effort because it would be an enormous effort um, to incorporate all the needs for transitional justice, international justice mechanisms, um, so many things and then the, the great variety of needs in, in subject terms. I wonder if the effort will be, um, will be worth it. But maybe something going back to the core, um, to the core of attributes of entities and maybe not so much the, the, the classification, the terminology because that's always changing and uh, the variety is enormous depending mm. on the subjects that people work on. I don't know, I think. I, difficult question, difficult answer. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Aida. Uh, Bert. Yeah, I think the things uh, have, have moved along a lot since, since we basically did, did our work in uh, the task force and, and also like needs have evolved a lot. I, I fully agree on with all the comments just made by Aida. I, I see a lot of uh, new opportunities in terms of technologies, but also new challenges in terms of uh, information sources, in, in, in terms of how information is going to be used. Um, and also, I, I fully agree that, that we actually should try to, to keep it as simple as, as, as possible. Um, I would basically start such a project by uh, doing an assessment of uh, the organizations who at present are using Harry tools, in particular WASI, for the documentation of, of, of cases of human rights violations. What are the, the forms, um, structures, terminologies, which, which, they are, which they are using? 
And what are the common elements those, of, of those? What, what are the differences? And take that as a starting point, uh, trusting that you know, this will be a representation of you know, the, uh, a larger number of, 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 of groups uh, all over the world. And, and then they b b bring in other organizations as well. But, but already starting by, by seeing what, what's going on at the moment would, would be useful uh, exercise. Thank you, Bert. And finally, Judith. Well, I'm going to echo a couple of things that the others said. I think, um, number one, what Bert said about look at what's out there and listen. Uh, as I said before, uh, who's using the Herodox standards and who also is doing other things, maybe adapting the Herodox standards or maybe using the events methodology, but in a different way, or maybe documenting in a different way entirely. So look what's out there, first of all. Second, compare that, I guess, with the technology that's possible now, bearing in mind the risks. Someone, uh, Marcus, in the chat box mentioned uh, geolocation and metadata is a source of risk. Yes, it is. And we recognized the risk of the sensitive information that we had right from the start. Keep that foremost. Protecting the inv individual is really critical. Uh, Ida mentioned, be clear about what's being documented. So the adaptations that are made from whatever tools are developed, one of the principles that perhaps isn't clear enough in either of, in any of these books is be very, very clear about what you want to document um, and don't make it too broad because if it's too broad, you'll get lost in the rabbit maze. Um, and um, I would say take into account the many, the many advantages of technology today. For example, in report writing, we all know that in the universities today, the, you can churn out a paper using artificial intelligence that apparently from <laughs> what I understand, uh, they're pretty good. And I have some professor friends who have told me they don't need me anymore. What happened to factory workers way back when they got kicked out because machines did the work? Well, maybe now I'm redundant because uh, AI can write my papers. Um, well, maybe some of that can be done, can be used for report writing. Again, bearing in mind the risks, but there you have it. So I guess, and the final thing I would say is the most important thing is the adaptation. Allow for how adaptation will happen um, and accept that it will and don't make a rigid box, but give the guidelines, as Bert said, um, as a starting point so that everybody is not reinventing the wheel uh, and then train in that way. So I think the how on, in terms of technology will probably come up in some of the sessions that follow this um, because there are all of these new technologies and I'm very curious to see what's going to happen. Thank you so much, Judith. And again, uh, Bert, Ida, Judith, thank you so much for sharing your experience, your knowledge. Um, and really creating this thread of continuity between what you've all done in, during the last 30, 40 years and what we are embarking to do uh, within the next X number, within the next <laughs> three, five years. And I'm, yes, wish us luck. Or I guess at this point, wish me luck. And <laughs> I bring <laughs> put together a task force and I'll be, we'll be lucky to, to be able to come up with a task force that um, uh, is parallel with what you all have done before. Um, again, thank you to our speakers for today. I would also like to, again, thank the Permanent Mission of Denmark to the United Nations in Geneva and the Dasta Stiftung for um, supporting this webinar. Tomorrow, we're shifting gears uh, for the second part of this webinar series. And we're actually, we've invited uh, speakers uh, who have engaged with or utilized the events methodology, standard format, or micro tesauri in their recent works uh, to give us an idea of how the event standard 30 years since uh, is actually being utilized in new forms and in new ways, whether it's creating databases, doing um, statistical analysis, uh, developing uh, 
ontologies or coming up with uh, monitoring mechanisms. Um, we'll be joined by uh, Jorin Lindenberg, uh, Ken McLean, Patrick Ball, and Sarah Torsner tomorrow. So there's a joke somewhere there about uh, a statistician, a documentalist, an academic, and an ontologist um, enters a bar. Uh, <laughs> we'll have those discussions tomorrow. Uh, and we're moving from an internal Eurodox uh, uh, panel to an external Eurodox panel. Um, thank you again, everyone. And uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. That would be 1500 CEST.